Welcome to the ID10T podcast number 1122. Uh, today's date is May 28th, 2021. And uh, this weekend for Memorial Day weekend, ID10T.com is doing a sale, a 30% off sale on the website. So go there and save 30% off. Um, so uh, yes, that is ID10T.com. You can sign up for our email list, which I uh, ask and encourage you to do so we can let you know about stuff. And then I can also let you know about uh, stand-up comedy dates that I'll be having that are coming up yeah, somewhat soonish. <laughs> Maybe not in the next couple months, but soon thereafter. So ID10T.com for that. Let's talk about you, the ID10T community. Events at ID10T.com like KMB, who writes... Uh, I have some good friends who for many years have supplied nerdy and nerd-adjacent handmade pottery through their website, polystudios.com, P-A-W-L-E-Y. Uh, most of their business has been through large commercial orders acquired through trade shows. Those trade shows haven't been happening, and who knows when they will start again. So they have found new customers by joining local farmer's markets. So if you happen to be in the Nashville area and you want to purchase some handmade porcelain treasures, the Nashville Farmer's Market has you covered. They're open Friday through Sunday, and you can get all the information you want about the Nashville Farmer's Market at nashvillefarmersmarket.org, or you can order from them directly at paulystudios.com, P-A-W-L-E-Y studios.com. Thank you so much, K&B, for uh, sharing this information about some really cool uh, porcelain stuff. If anyone else wants to share their thing, events at id10t.com is the way to do that. This episode is my pal Garrett Dillahunt, who is a phenomenal actor, and uh, I first became aware of him on a little program called Deadwood, uh, one of the greatest shows in the history of television, and he, he was so amazing on, the, on Deadwood and has done some really just fantastic roles in other great things, including a little show called Fear the Walking Dead, uh, where he plays John Dory. So um, we got to be friends uh, as a result of that. And uh, I really like Garrett a lot. He's just a good dude. He's promoting Army of the Dead, which is Zack Snyder's uh, Army of the Dead, which is on Netflix now. As soon as you're done with his podcast, you can race to your content device, be it uh, a laptop, a television, a phone, or some type of internet pad. Uh, tablet, and uh, you can watch uh, Army of the Dead on Netflix. So here we go. This is the ID10T podcast. Oh, and there are some spoilers if you're not caught up on the current season of Fear the Walking Dead. If you are, if you are not watching this current epi- uh, season of Fear the Walking Dead, uh, there are some spoilers in this episode. So I just wanted to give you fair warning uh, about that. Uh, Okay, now I will start. Now we resume the starting of the episode uh, number 1122 of the ID10T podcast with Garrett Dillahunt. Roll the thing. Initiating ID10T protocol. Oh, Garrett Dillahunt, it's so nice to see your face. Uh, where are you right now? I'm in beautiful New Orleans. <laughs> okay, because that looks like it. That looks like the the uh, the hotel door notice of like these are the emergency exits. That's exactly right. I was doing I was doing some other Zoom interviews this morning. We're doing press for Army of the Dead today, and uh, they didn't like my setup, so they made me turn this way. <laughs> I mean. I was- I was facing this one. I thought that sort of crown over the bed was kind of... Oh, that looks really cool. That's a cool background. And they're like, no, we want to see the door with the weird hit and emergency exit route on it. That's so funny. I mean, it's 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 to no end. It del- it's, it's hilarious to me that, you know, what we've traded in for having to travel everywhere is like, well, now you got to have good lighting and a background and, you know... I know. I don't know what to do. <laughs> It's it's so weird to me that they decided that rather than seeing that sort of cool bed frame and the wall thing, they'd rather see the electrical box in the background. <laughs> yeah, 
I guess it doesn't matter for us. It's just the, the way the windows were. Oh, the lighting. Yeah, you know that's what I mean? good, though. That, that's like good dramatic lighting. That's like, yeah. That's like, good. what if I do the whole thing like this? Just like <laughs> half your face. <laughs> yeah, I think a lounge on the bed. How about that? <laughs> my, wife, my wife and I, my, when we first started dating, she immediately booked a job and had to move to, I want to say North Carolina, maybe for six months. So all, like the majority of our dating was really done through FaceTime. So we had a lot of these like late night, just lying in bed. Hey, what do you know? Here's my room. What are you doing? How's it going? You know, so this feels, this, this feels, this has that nice feel to it. The other yeah. option that oh, you have is yeah. just pretend like, you know, yeah. <laughs> we, we could just pretend that we're really old and don't know technology. Okay. Am I doing it right? Is this right? Yeah. Oh my, where's the, where's the recall? I don't know where the button is. Oh. Where's <laughs> I'm gonna sit over here. Fuck it. Now everyone, now everyone's, now everyone just, everyone knows technology. There was a time when you really had to be a super nerd to understand technology, and it's so interesting just how seamlessly it's woven into the fabric of our culture now. Yeah, man. I, I, I don't know. My my nephews are the ones I call to like fix my iPhone or any of that stuff. Yeah, I don't, uh, I used to be real on top of like all of the, you know, knowing how to fix everything. And then at a certain point, I was just like, I don't have the brain space to, it's like, it changes so fast and so much. And so often the expectation that things have to be shiny every six to 12 months and new, or people are like, why isn't this new? It's like, Innovation has never progressed at this rate before in the history of mankind. <laughs> and now this, this consumer expectation of like, oh, you didn't add a thing or the camera didn't slightly change. You didn't get a couple more megapixels. So fuck you. It's not good anymore. It's like, this is the phone from like five generations ago was beyond what we needed. You know, the camera, the camera alone. Yeah. I have like, Six cameras, I think, like some really nice cameras. I got this whole Nikon set I used to take to movies with me back when you could take pictures on movie sets. Right. Um, well, you know, what are you going to do with that? You get that camera off set because you're going to blow things or whatever. And, I, you know, I've got a Leica. You know, I've got this Leica monochrome. I've got a Noctilux lens for it. And I never use them. You know, I, I, I feel terrible. You know, I, I use my phone most of the time to take pictures. Well, that's understandable. It's just it's just easier than having to yeah. travel with another thing that, by the way, you have to be very mindful of, especially when you're talking about big, nice, delicate lenses. And yeah. then your phone, like, you just put a case in it, you know, you drop it and you take it back and fix the glass. And, you know, it's like it's not it's not the same as dropping a lens. Hit a button and it does all, the, you know, the background goes away and you're, like, in chat and, like, this wasn't even what it looked like when I... <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone takes pictures, but there are very few photographers. You know what I mean? Like there's not like the, we all do it. I mean, I take pictures, but I would not consider myself a photographer. Those two, those are two very different things. I got to get back to it though. I'm not, I feel guilty. I feel bad that I said it. People are going to be like, oh, what a entitled. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so at all because I think everyone sort of faces that where you want to, you really want to, you know, especially it's easy to get dazzled by, Oh my God, I'm going to get this gorgeous camera and this gorgeous equipment and all this stuff. And then you get psyched up about it. And then at the end of the day, it, you know, oftentimes it'll just sit in a closet because you're in a rush and it's just easier to take your phone. Yeah. But if you're traveling, it's like, I don't really have room. And now it's really heavy. You know? Well, and it, it's easy to sort of understand the difference between pictures and photography, especially like with our mutual friend, Tyler Shields, where you look at, and he shoots so fast too. And he just gets these brilliant, like the composition and the lighting and everything. And you're like, Oh, Oh, that's photography. That's photography. I was just taking pictures and like fucking with the filters a little bit, you know, on the, in the app. That's, this is not, I was not doing photography. From IG. I'm glad there are still photographers because it must be frustrating to them. If there's, Cause when I was a kid, I had, there's, you know, look, there's probably, Let's be generous and say there's a hundred pictures of me as a baby, you know. Right. There's probably, you know, a hundred. 
there's that, that that's a day that's in a, in a day now for kids just like so many photos of themselves and videos i wonder if it's going to spawn like this whole generation of of auteurs and inventive filmmakers or you know i don't know everyone's going to be so comfy in front of a camera maybe they'll i don't know well i think i think it'll also spawn a generation of like um retro you know people using like pinhole camera you know just like really classic yeah yeah old just just because it's you know it um i mean it, yeah. Yeah. yeah but it just it still looks different it still looks a bit different to do it the old fashioned way you know it's like it just it has a certain look the same way that vinyl has a certain sound and uh, you know i think people will see it you know, like we used to take pictures that way out of necessity because that was the equipment that's involved. And now I think we can do it as an artistic choice. It's a style rather than just a necessity. Right, right. You're right. I guess, I, I mean, I hope so. I think that would be cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's... A little bit, slow it down. Yeah, I, I, I really, I, I foresee that because I think that, uh, you know, I mean, with, with kids growing up now, it's like, oh, what did they used to do in the old days, you know? And then I mean, at a certain point, they'll just be like, it's just too much of a pain in the ass to carry all this shit around. <laughs> Let me just program a picture. What are you shooting right now? Are you allowed to say? Yeah, yeah. I'm here shooting a movie called Where the Crawdads Sing. It's adapted from a novel of the same name, a very popular novel I've learned. Like it's all these, breaking all these records. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, it's the story of this swamp girl in the, you know, 50s and the next 20, 25 years of her life, maybe. And, you know, it's a murder mystery and, a, you know, and I, and I play her father back in the, in flashback, you know, not the best dad. That's why I've got my white trash stub on. <laughs> oh, I always just keep it on all the time because I'm, I'm like, why do you know <laughs> yours then? <laughs> I shave with an actual razor blade maybe twice a year, if that. And I and I go, ah, I don't. This is just it, it's a camera thing. It's too much. It's just too much to do this. I don't. I don't Let's have time. See. In the old days, we used a straight razor. Let's try that. <laughs> yeah, you'd go to a barber shop and they'd scrape it off your face with a blade, and then you'd get a bloodletting. <laughs> and then you take a picture with your pinhole camera. And you're... <laughs> <laughs> you had to sit there for nine hours. Still, you couldn't breathe. <laughs> I like playing the old man game because it's like, you don't even have to go back that far to sound like an old person. You really just have to go back a few years and everything's progressed so fast. You I, don't, I don't feel old, you know, but you do the math and you're like, oh, oh, I guess some time has passed. <laughs> the best thing is just to not do the math. <laughs> there you go. Another reason math is bad. I'm sure you must. Do you ever do the, do you ever do the performer thing of comparative? Okay, when uh, all right, you know, by the time Steve Martin was my age, he oh, dot man. dot dot. You know, oh fuck, you know, or it's that's like the one death. that's death. It's death. It's death. When you're like, well, Bill Murray was like 34 when they did Ghostbusters. What the fuck? You know, like that. That shit really punches me in the chest. I mean, I first met you, and you were a comedian. You, do you still do stand up at all? Or? Well, I haven't because of the pandemic, but yes. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, I was up until like a couple days before quarantine last year, and then and then I'm booking dates for oh, cool, cool. possibly the fall, definitely 2022. I've already booked dates. So yeah, I'll be, I'll be back on the road when that's. I don't know why. That's the most terrifying prospect to me. Just, I, I don't know how y'all do it. I really don't. Just, there's nothing between you and them. You know, I, I guess, you know, you get really good. I guess, but I just, I can't, I can't imagine it. I think if you were to ask any comedian, they would say it doesn't really feel like a choice. It's more of a compulsion to do it. And just something about your mindset. You, when you start out, a lot of your shows are just not great. It's just the way it works, but something in your mind is like, but I got to get up and do it again. But that must feel the same. I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way about, about acting, you know, like, Oh, how, I don't know. How do you do that? How do you, call up these how do you on demand your emotions you know what i mean like that to me feels like how the fuck do you do that you know and, and then do it multiple times for close-ups and different shots and right i guess i always felt the difference was you know somebody's written something for me <laughs> right here's what you're gonna say garrett and i suppose comedians you know you, you 
they'll use the phrase I've written a new show. So at least there's a loose outline, I guess, you know what you're going to talk about, but it always seems so. And a lot of comedians don't, they're just completely reacting to the audience or off the cuff. And I'm, and to be given a time limit and be like, okay, you got to, you know, you got 10 minutes, yeah. which is, is a long time or whatever to just wing it. I mean, that's just not my, that doesn't sound like fun to me. <laughs> but, it, but since we're, we're peeking over the fence at each other's, you know, <laughs> career yards, I, I think for me, like acting or even sketch comedy or whatever, it feels limiting because it feels like you're not in control of almost any of it. You don't have any responsibility for any of it other than what you can do in the moment and just hope it all, hope the good takes get used and the lighting's good and the music's good and everything. And, but then on top of that, you're really confined, you know, unless you're doing like a Christopher Guest movie, you're really confined to whatever the words on the page are with some minor, like, you know, you might be able to change a word here and there with some directors, but to me, it feels like, Oh, your, your craft is very confining, confining. And for me, if things aren't working, I can just pivot on a dime. And, and I, I feel that makes me feel safe. You're right. You're right. Cause I, you know, there's been a lot of times, some of them more recent than others. I would have liked to have pivoted when stuff wasn't working. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I don't think this is very, I think this is not, uh, let's pivot. Let's pivot. Yeah. And, and you don't always have the freedom to do that. So what do you do in those moments where you're like, okay, this, this doesn't, this isn't quite working the way that I am the way that I would prefer it to. So how do I just as a performer, just perform my way through it? Well, you're right. You know, now, now that you mention it and even more and more as I, as I, <laughs> you know, you get older and you get more experienced and you, you, a great thing about that passage of time is you just, uh, you don't, you don't care as much. You're just like, I don't need to, I don't feel, I don't have to be cool. You know what? I don't have to stay here if I don't, want to. <laughs> I don't have to do that. You know what? Let's just, let's just, let's just call it a day or, but that's not what you're asking. Really. You're, you're talking about like on the day. On the day you're in it, you're in it. Yeah. Just something doesn't feel right or it's not, or you're, you're, or whatever, if the director, you're not really seeing eye to eye or it's not being communicated or you just, or you just have that feeling like when things just feel like they're not aligned and you're like, I just, mm, I don't know. This doesn't feel, you know, like. How, I, well, I, I mean, sometimes I'm wrong. I'll say that, you know, like, uh, like I, I remember winter's bone at one point thinking like, I'm not sure what's going on here. You know, is this going to, is this going to work? And it's this brilliant movie. So I clearly, clearly didn't know what the hell I was talking about. You know, I didn't, wasn't enough aware of the big picture, you know, but I, I guess on the day, I guess the, the, the insurance for that situation is you've, you've been really careful about the job you took. Huh? That's like the only way, like work with people you trust, you know, really vet them out. Um, but, but maybe that's also the miracle of it. You know, that it's a real, it's a real alchemy that needs to happen for, that's kind of the miraculous thing I love about this business, about my, my side of this business. It's, it's, it's like a, a feat of, of, it's like a magical act. If it all works, if, if it then becomes this great product, you know, it's hard to make a really good film or TV show, you know? Yeah, because you're, you're like trying, that. absolutely because you're trying to articulate like the project has to articulate so many different crafts and people just aiming at the same thing basically. And it's like, yeah. are they all? Is it all? Is everyone aimed in the right way? And even if everyone feels like they're on the same page, it still doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna all come together in the right way. I mean, you know, I think the easiest way to translate is like, okay, well, I'm gonna, I want to. I'm going to draw a person riding a horse. And in my mind, I see a very clear picture of a person riding a horse and then I draw it and it looks like, really? you know, it looks like a, a, like an EKG flatlining, you know? And, and it's like, Oh, but that's not what was in my head. How do I get that into my hands? I don't know. I guess that's experience. I think so. But it's also, you know, it's also kind of trusting or maybe it's not caring. Like you can't, you can't be in control of everything, you know? Right. Every take is not going to be great. You know, there's certainly been times, there's been so many times I've also been wrong, you know? So it's like, maybe, maybe you're just not 
you just, you take the job, you enjoy it as much as you can, and then uh, go home at the end of the day. You know, it's, it's in the can. It's done. There's nothing. You can't get it back. So, you know, trust everybody. And, and maybe, maybe that's the key, you know, and not, not be such a, a jackass on set that you got all the answers, you know. <laughs> And also probably understanding that it's a process and like your career is a process and th- some things are going to turn out better than others, but nothing, but things rarely hinge on one job. I mean, like y- y- yeah. y- y- it's like the, 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 those jobs are all of a sudden it's, and, and generally the jobs where it's like, Oh my God, this person totally broke out and they got nominated for a thing and there are multiple things that it's like, when you really look at it, that was not an overnight story. It's very rare that that happens. That was the culmination of many projects that you realize, like, oh, that person's been working for a decade or two. And I just didn't know about those other things. You know, it's like you never see the, all the work that goes into the craft. Yeah. You know, that, that reminds me of a, a theater story. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Not. But I, I, was, I was doing this play with Frank Langella. I was pretty much fresh out of grad school called Booth. It was about, I played Edwin Booth, and he played Edwin's father, Junius Brutus Booth. You know, uh, John Wilkes was also in the play, but just a small part, obviously before he was going to assassinate the president. So it was all, these, all this theater stuff. And I got, I got savaged in the New York Times by the press, just destroyed. And up until that time, you know, I was naive, and I thought, I'm never going to get a bad review, because I had <laughs> You know, I was like, I'm determined, you know, I'm going to be so good. I'm going to work so hard. And I just got stabbed. And there was a whole paragraph devoted to how awful I was. Uh, so it was new to me in, in form and content. You know, usually it was just like a line or two saying like, he's good too, you know, or whatever. But this was just like, it would be so much better if Gary Dillahunt wasn't in this. <laughs> it was just bad, bad, bad. Really personal. <laughs> yeah. And I was, uh, you know, and the play continues because you have to keep going. You know, it's, it's why they say, you know, don't read reviews because right. the bad ones or the good ones can really fuck you up. You know, if you, if you like a guy's good review of your whatever, your movie, and then he, the same guy reviews your next one poorly, you can't say that, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about because you've already said, like, oh, I believed it when he said great things. Right, right. right. So you shouldn't, you should just ignore him. And, and I was laughing when I read it, you know, I was reading it to, to my friends, but you know, it was tricky. And uh, at the time my co-star was seeing this, this, he was seeing Alan Barkin mm-hmm. and to avoid the kind of crush of people in his dressing room at the end of the, <laughs> of the show every night, you know, who were wishing him well, mine was nice and quiet. You know? <laughs> he came and she came and hung in mine with me. And, she, and one day she said, you know, how you doing? You know, what's her like crooked face. And, uh, and I said, I'm okay. You know, and she's like, you know, sorry about that review. And, and, and then she told me a story about her. She was working on a movie with Robert Duvall and a previous movie she had done. She just got destroyed in the press and it was wrecking her. Like she said, I wasn't, you know, they, they had to call the shooting one day because she just couldn't function because she'd been so destroyed right, by this right. thing. And Duvall came to set the next day with the notebook. And in it was a bad review for everything he'd ever done. <laughs> the Godfather, Tender Mercies, the things he's won Oscars for, you know. The, and he just was like, look, you'll work again. Oh, my. Like, the whole point was, it doesn't fucking matter. Right. What do you think, you know? And, and it's true, you know. It's, I, I, most of the time, I know when I suck, you know, I, I'm really my hardest critic. You probably are too. So you, you don't even really need it. You know what I right. mean? And, it's, yeah. and what are you going to do? Quit? You know what I mean? Well, and because we're our own hardest critic, that's why some of these times would, you know, like if you get a bad review of something, it just, it just pokes at that. Oh, is this just confirming this thing that I think about myself or, you know, like, and in a way, some of what we do really more for comedians for comedians than actors, but th- there is, you know, like the approval for a comedian is vital to our survival because we need people to show up at our shows and we get that instant feedback. So it's part commerce and then part ego, like largely ego, but, but still it's hard to separate those two things and go, okay, 
because so much of our business is based on the approval process. Yes, you can work on this movie. Yes, you can direct this thing. Yes, you you know, but a lot of the times, especially the beginning, it's no, 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 no. So we we have to, you know, fight our way through a swamp of rejection just to start to get to the, you know, to the to the good part. So it's it's tricky because it is. It, it threatens our, it, 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 it hits our survival. Like it can threaten our survival. If someone says this guy sucks in this thing, it's like, Oh my God. So having Robert Duvall go, you're going to work again. Look, see, like just know it, just accept that fact. You know, yeah. this isn't, this is now what you do for better. Yeah. There's guys that make, you know, horrible movie after horrible movie, one after another, they just keep making it. Like no, no one says stop. You know, it's, it's weird. <laughs> well, you you know, I, they, they'll dig these up every once in a while on the internet where you'll look back at, you know, a, a revered movie. I mean, I can't think of an example, but movies on the level of like, you know, yeah. Gr- Groundhog Day or Ghostbusters or Back to the Future. And, you know, anyway, and find like a bad review where someone was like, this is the word, you know. And yeah. it's like, well, who was right? I guess that was the guy who felt that he was right. That was his opinion. But also the box office was right because all those all these people liked it. So... Yeah. You know, like either one, you know, like what are you going to focus on? And that famous story, like, you know, the studio not wanting Al Pacino in The Godfather and just like, you know, the crew laughing at him as he's doing this scene. I mean, can you imagine? First of all, <laughs> just like laughing, you know, and then comes the scene where he, sh- where he, you know, goes to the bathroom, gets the gun, comes out and shoots everybody in the re- restaurant, you know, and, and then the studio's like, okay. Okay, I see, I see it. Now. You know? <laughs> yeah, but it's so, and this is just the way the business works. All those people that were like, "This is the worst idea ever." I knew this was going to be great. Yeah, Al, you were always our guy. Really? I mean, you know, but that's just the way it works. You got it. It just goes to show, right? You just gotta, you got, you got to be honest with yourself, but you got to also bet on yourself. You know. That's such great advice. It's just, I think the things that, the things that make you great, not just you, but you in the, in the performer sense, the things that make you great, the sensitivities that you have and the empathies and the being able to embody characters in dramatic situations, you're the sensitive in a way, almost like an emotional medium in a way, you know, but that sensitivity also means that you can be sensitive. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, it's true. You know, you, there's a, there's a certain sort of skinlessness in an artist, you know, and that, that leaves you vulnerable to sometimes even the slightest breeze, you know, can be kind of painful. Yeah. But maybe that's, maybe that's the downside. You know? Maybe, but it's just, it's just, it's just doing what you were saying and navigating in that healthy way and going, okay, this doesn't mean everything. And this is, you know, no one thing. It's just like, keep going. But I really like the idea and not just for acting, but I think for any, any kind of pursuit where someone's really trying to break into something where you are talking about, like you do, you vet the process and the everyone involved. And you're like, in a way you go from auditioning and hoping that you get any job, anyone will hire you to No, I'm going to audition them. (laughs) I want to make sure they're right for me. That's harder to do in the beginning, especially when you're just trying to survive, but it's also a very powerful shift when you can. Well, it's, it's love or money they say, right? Or the reasons you do a job, you know, it's a completely valid reason to take a job, even if it's a shitty job, because you need money. You got right. abilities, you got, you know, you got to put the kids through school or whatever, or eat, you know, but if, if you have the luxury of maybe being able to take some time every once in a while, it sure does make a difference in your happiness. If you can, you know, be a little choosy. Right. Right. Yeah. Because then you really feel those, you really feel that difference when you're doing it for you. And at least, at least if it doesn't turn out in a way that you want it, at least you can go, well, but at least I chose to do that. You know, like I, I do like that responsibility of not, it's, it's those ones where it's like you, you do a job or you do something where you're like, I didn't really want to do this. And then it doesn't go well. And you're like, God damn it. I fucking didn't even want to, I knew, I knew. And it's still, you know, well, I have, I have, I have friends who've, won Oscars and, and, and I know, and I'm not going to name them because it's, you know, the story I'm about to tell, but I know sometimes they've said to their people, like, I need to win another Oscar, you know, like, and, and I know they didn't win the first one because they had that mindset, you know, right. they had the mindset, they, they won one because 
they just made something that they loved. You know, they just were like, they had no expectations about it. Maybe no one's going to see the thing. Right. Those things always turn out better than if your aim is, I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be rich. I'm, you know, I'm going to win awards. Like, uh, I've been fortunate to be a part of a lot of award-winning movies and not award-winning because of me necessarily, I'm saying, but seeing the guys making the movie, seeing the guys starring in the movie, I, I never, there was never, you know, their driving force was never awards. Right. It was just, you know, it's, it's almost the opposite. It's this, this purity of, of storytelling, this purity of spirit, you know, that's, that's the way the best stories get told. Well, yeah, because you, you can't, and, and even if goals are tricky, right? Because they, they give us direction, like a goal gives you direction, but I think you have to be flexible enough to sort of recognize what a goal isn't serving you, you know, which is hard to do. But if your goal is to win an award and then you win that award, okay, now what, you know what I mean? Like it's, like you said, oh, I need to win another one. I, oh, but I thought you won. Yeah, 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 yeah. But now I, you know, I, I always have to keep trying to, and my wife is really good at going, oh, I think you're doing that thing where you're like, oh, I just want this thing. And then you get it and you're like, yeah, but it's not quite, you know, it's that sort of like constant dissatisfaction. It's like, it's okay to be satisfied with things or just the process of things. But that, that kind of chasing that result is, is real tricky and dangerous. It it's, kind of goes hand in hand with the comparison game you were talking about earlier, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because there's no, like, I mean, it, it, if, if you look back at your life, you know, I think those result moments, Oh, I won this or I got to do this thing. They're not necessarily as fulfilling as like, Oh, I had this experience where I did this thing with all these people. And I don't know, would you, would you say that some of your most, do you have those experiences that are like, this is, this experience was more valuable to me, even though no one saw this thing than this other thing that a lot of people lauded and saw, you know, that was fine. But this other experience was really just more intimate and personal. I think so. Absolutely. I, I, I think, you know, you, I mean, it's almost two different things, but isn't it? But there's, there's some, some movies I've done that were just the greatest experiences, but weren't great movies at the end of the day, you know, and sometimes you don't have a great time. You're not necessarily having fun on a movie and the movie turns out amazing. You know, just, you know, the, the sensitivity maybe of the team wasn't on display in the making of the thing, but boy, the putting it together, it really, you know, the, the vision held. Um, But I, I think there's definitely, what I'm bad at is, is realizing that value. Like I, I have a great experience, whatever, like you said, the result of this project is, you know, whatever, good, bad, but it, the dividends it's going to pay down the road, you know, are huge. And if you can start piling those up, because let's say, I mean, in a hundred years, no one's going to be talking about Gary Dillahunt's film and TV shows, probably, you know, probably n- none of us. You know, what, what What are we doing here? You know, we might as well do things that we love, do things that fulfill us and maybe contribute something decent to the world. You know, I, I don't remember who won Oscars two or three years ago. You know, I'd have to look it up, you know. And maybe I would if I was ever nominated for one. My story might change, you know, like, you know what, Chris, you know, now I think awards are quite uh, indicative. I think I actually am the best. And, I know uh, what I said before, but that was before I was nominated, and that sort of changed. Well, I mean, it's it's like that's the other part of the comparison game where I think it's very comforting. Where you think about, well, there's people now who don't know who Paul McCartney is, or there are people who don't right. know who Elvis is, and you know, you, all you have to do is just just look back at film stars of the 1930s, and you know, like. Uh, Roderick Knickerbocker was the number one box office star from 1932 to 40. And you're like, you like, who the fuck is that? But then you really take that in and go, this person was the most famous person in the world or the business for like 12. It's a long time. You know, I'm, I'm making up a person, but I mean that idea and I've never heard of them. So yeah. So what, you know, like, so why am I so concerned about, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> knowing me 
people. The size of jobs or the size of, but again, it's some of it is because there's a certain degree of that that kind of helps lead to more work, give you more options, you know, try to create some security in what is really a wildly insecure business that's not remotely stable. I mean, and and really, if your goal is to get rich, and so you're like, I'm going to become an actor, I'm going to become a comedian, I think we both would tell them there's easier ways to get rich if that's your only goal, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Most, Most actors I know live below the poverty level, you know, it's, it's really... It's 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 really dicey, and, and maybe the purest form of it is community theater, you know, or you know, just people telling each other stories. And you're like, oh, there's the dentist up there playing Stanley Kowalski, you know. Like your imagination does the rest, you know. It's it's a really it's a really weird profession, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and and, I, and I'm sure people, as they get success and sort of think like, oh, and if that if that's the only thing that they're after, and they go, oh, this really wasn't what I thought it was. Gosh, I really miss those days when I was living in a studio apartment and just like doing real stuff and hanging out and didn't have a lot of responsibilities and really just got to you know, and uh, but I, I do think that part and parcel sometimes with the artistic process is a degree of dissatisfaction or like a degree of discomfort that kind of lights the fire to that. You, you know, you got to fuel and then, the, and then what comes out is the art stuff, you know? So may, maybe that's just the constant, wherever you're at, the kind of artistic creative mind is, is just a little bit dissatisfied and that's what helps to kind of fuel the process. I don't know. It might be, you know, I, oh. did, I did a play one time with Olympia Dukakis, you know, who just, just recently passed away. Uh, called The Milk Train Doesn't Stop Here Anymore. It's a little known, well, a little done a Tennessee Williams play. We did it at Williamstown. And I was like her little boy toy. You know, she was an aging starlet or whatever in the day. And, uh, and I remember she was just talking about how things changed for her as she got older. She was talking about being backstage, waiting for her entrance. And she said, and I was looking at the doorknob that I was going to go through. And I thought, eh. I could open it or I couldn't, <laughs> you know, and, and it's just like her point was your reasons change for doing things, you know, right. she went through the door, you know, but it, it wasn't necessarily all driven by the same things as you, as you go through the different seasons of your life, you know? Yeah. I mean, as, as you start to f- discover things that are more important to you or I, I always, I always find it interesting that when performers or actors or comedians or musicians or whatever, they, just kind of just kind of disappear or something that people go, Oh, how sad their career. It's like, there's this general, like, Oh, how sad. And it's like, what do you mean? Like that person could have discovered happiness or just didn't feel like they needed to chase this thing anymore. And just cause they're not as famous or, you know, or quote relevant as they used to be. It's like, what if they're the happiest they've ever been, you know, like, and we don't ever, we, we don't, we tend to not reward or celebrate, you know, like, health like emotional health <laughs> as much as like fame or the this person did this it's like well but you know, i hope i'm not you know like 85 and still like posting you know shirtless selfies on fucking whatever the instagram of the social media of the day is you know what i mean i still got it <laughs> you know uh, uh listen i think just as I think now you have to, but just for comedy, like just to be fun. I still got it. Look at this. Hold up an old headshot and all that, you know, eight by 10 glossy. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just like the, the, the four panel of where you got different, like you right, got a top right. hat on and then a, the suspender, yeah, the baseball bat with a glove on the end of it. When it was announced that you were coming on to fear the walking dead, I was so excited because you really are one of those guys that, you know, it's like, oh, that guy's fucking good. Like, he does cool stuff. I mean, I, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, because it's been a while since I saw it, but it's obviously it's one of the greatest shows in television. Did you not play two different characters on Deadwood? I did. I mean, technically three, because I snuck into the movie. I snuck into the movie. It was David Milch, right? It was David Milch. Yeah. And so was, was there any kind of like, well, maybe people won't notice or like, you know, it doesn't matter because it's like a play and, and a play. Cause that show really was like a play. It was acted like a, this brilliant theatrical piece. 
Was it just like, you know what? It doesn't matter. It's like you're two different characters and that's just the way. You know, I don't know if that's what he thought. I, I guess I should have grilled him more, but I, I, I remember, I remember my last day as Jack McCall, who was the only, who was an actual historical figure, you know, Walcott was not. And I, I was uh, sad because I really enjoyed my time. No one knows, you know, I'm not a real famous guy anyway. I'm not a real famous guy now, you know, but certainly not then. You know, I was fresh out of, well, 10 years out of school. You know, I hadn't done it much TV. I'd done most, mostly theater. You know, I, I rode my bike down the West Side Highway to Chelsea Piers to audition for this. I was, I had an audition for Bullock. But before I even got there, they were like, oh, we cast it, you know. Well, you really want to read this other part? You know, so I was like, okay. <laughs> and they wanted me to read for the doc. And I was like, the doc? I never get the doc, you know? And I, I sat in the waiting room and it was all these older gentlemen with, you know, walrus mustaches and, you know, Brad Dourif played, ended up playing the doc. Right. So I went in the room and there's Walter Hill and David and, you know, and I was like, you know, I, I'll never get the doc, you know? <laughs> And David was like laying on the floor because he has back issues. And he was like, whoa, 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 that's, uh, that's uh, self-defeating. Uh, will you read this other part? I was like, that's what I was hoping you'd say. And so they gave me Jack. I went out in the hall and let a few other people come in. Then I came back in and, and read for Jack and ended up getting it. And, uh, you know, I was supposed to have this cross-eyed contact lens because apparently his eye was all fucked up. But it didn't arrive in time. They changed the shooting dates. And so I was like, well... I can do this, you know, I could do this droopy eyed thing, you know, and I'd, I'd done a whole play this way once for a guy who'd just been in a fight. And so that became the thing for him. And I think because of that, and we just had this really gnarly chewed up beard, I, I was kind of harder to recognize than maybe I would have been. Uh, and no one knew who I was. And on my last day as McCall, I'd had such a good time. You know, David's, I think, a dream to work for. I really like working the way he works, which is often, you know, flying by the seat of your pants. You know, he'll, he'll throw out new stuff, literally hot pages, like right out of the printer, you know, for the day. And it's chunks of dialogue. Um, I just like working that way. I, I, I like the, the dynamicness of that and the immediacy of it. But I was sad. And I said, I said as much to David. I was like, so it was my last day, you know, I was like, ah. I'm sad. And he's like, yeah, well, uh, come here, come here. And we went to the gem saloon, which wasn't being used that day. So it was empty. We sat at this gem table, you know, my heart's pounding. Cause I don't, I'm not comfortable yet in this world. You know, this is one of my earliest jobs. And he said, I, I got an idea. You know, I want you to play George Hurst. You know, it was this whole plan for me to play Hurst. Oh my God. You know, that's my wife's great, great grandfather. Yes. <laughs> and, so, and the, the Gerald McCraney ended up playing him. That's right. And so we had this whole thing, you know, we, I, I went to the makeup guy because it was, you know, I finished mid first season and this guy wasn't going to show up till second season. So they had to finish filming the first season. There'd be the break and it would air. And then there was, so I had a long time, but we were going to, we did this whole thing with my hairline was going to shave back like that. This prosthetic nose. Cause he was closer than my age at the time than Gerald, I guess. Um, and I was doing a play back East and David called uh, and he's like, listen, isn't, uh, he's going to be more of an off screen presence in season two. So it's, it's not going to happen. And I was devastated, but I played it cool, you know, cause I was busy doing some Shaw play, you know, in summer stock. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, but, but I think him sensing my, that I'd be afraid or, or maybe him being afraid that I'd be afraid or, or sad. He said, but, uh, but there's this other guy who I think's right in your wheelhouse, this sort of advanced man for Hearst, this geologist named Wolcott. And that's, that's how I got Wolcott. That's, that's fantastic. Cause I was just, uh, by the way, I did, I did, I, my wife had never seen Deadwood. And when we started dating, I was like, well, you got to see it. Cause you know, you're great, great grandpa. And what about she feels about that. Well, she, she was, she was delighted by it when she was like, I mean, this isn't, that's not, you know, he was definitely not a gangster, you know, which basically, which basically George Hurst was in Deadwood. He was basically like a gangster. Like he had his sort of territories and, 
you know, and the um, the fight between his guy and Swearingen's guy yeah. is one of the most brutal, realistic yeah. fight. Like, like where the eye, like, it, and and also its portrayal of you know, like you know, like people are very cavalier about fighting and stuff. Now they just beat the shit out of each other. Like, let's go for a drink. Yeah. But to see these two big guys just destroy each other and then be really, really fu- emotionally fucked up by with such an interesting and, and I think poetic choice for that type of a Western, because we're just so accustomed to seeing Westerns where people fight and then they just dust off and then they they're off to the saloon. But it like it really fucks Dan up a lot, you know, emotionally what he did. And I was always really just, again, the depth of. Of, of what that show was uh, was it, it was really meaningful. I, I, I mean, I I love it. You know, it's it it's really is, has shaped my entire career, just in the way I think about projects and the way I think about scenes. And you know, I, I hate speaking for David. You know, there's I, I don't mean to imply that we're great pals or he has ever confided in me or that we've hung out much, but I, I just loved being in his presence and you know. I, you know, I saw him for the movie and, you know, he's battling uh, Alzheimer's now, but he still managed to write this script, this one final sort of fuck you, whatever, to this disease or whatever. And, you know, and he stood up when he saw me and and I hugged him and I told him I loved him. And, you know, I think he, I don't know, you know, it was just, it was, it was just quite, it was, it was quite the experience. And, uh, and it, it, it it really it really has shaped my taste level. I, I was That's really, really special. That's really special, and also you know again, it's it, that show and that story. I mean, it's in such a special place in the the pantheon of television. You know, like he the show ability is just you know because originally he he was coming to HBO with an idea about Rome. It was a it was a Roman story. And he didn't know that they already had that show Rome in the pipeline. So he, he pitched it and they were like, we like, we like these themes. Can you locate them anywhere else? And he was just like, yes, in the old West, you know? So they were like, do that, you know? Wow. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> you come in with this. I mean, that is, you know, that, that, that's where you like, you make your own luck. You know what I mean? Where it's like, I went in with this fully realized prepared thing and they go, it's got to be someone else. How about a Western? You know, okay. You know, I mean, like that, that kind of, that pivoting, you go, okay, well that, that explain. you know, like you can see why people are successful. And I think Bochco said it really well. He just said, I did, he didn't know anyone who's harnessed his demons for good more than David Milch has. Well, we did a, we did a Talking Dead the other day with uh, Keith Carradine, who again, I'm also, I'm also in awe. I mean, I, I, I often make the stupid joke to myself about, Walking Deadwood, where it's like so many great actors from Deadwood came over to, you know, you and Keith Carradine and Kim Dickens and Keith coming on as uh, as John Dory Sr. I was like, oh, that's really interesting because Garrett kills you in Deadwood. He kills when he goes, yeah, I was only on like four episodes and that fucking that guy kills me, you know, but he said he just he says such a love for you because you work together on that. And then you were opposite his daughter, Martha Plimpton on raising hope. And so that you, you, and now he's John Dory senior. And so you've had this kind of dance and, and he's just such a lovely, wonderful, even just the hour that I spent talking to him, just such a wonderful man. He seems. Well, that's good. That's good to hear. You know, I, I remember coming to his trailer with, and I had a, I had a book I wanted to give him. Shit, I can't remember what the book was but I was nervous because I was a fan. You know, like I said, I was pretty new to the game. I, and I think that's also another reason people didn't necessarily know it was me playing the second part. They weren't thinking to look for this guy. Right. Some people knew, but most people, most people immediately know now, like if they go back and watch the show. But anyway, I, I went to his trailer, you know, it was the last episode and I was, and I knocked on this trailer door and he's like, Oh, Hey man, you know? And, and I was just like, Ooh, little, little, sir, you know, I'm, and, I, and I remember seeing his face almost, almost fall a little bit. Like, like he was like, like he, he just wanted to be a guy, one of the guys, you know, right. you know, he just wanted to hang with it. And, and I was doing this thing, this, this thing. And he just was like, Oh, 
I, you know, I, I don't know if I want to be that to this person, you know. Right. And it's not that I'm saying I'm any kind of Keith Carradine or anything now, but, you know, when people now have done similar things to me, I, I know what he was feeling. Because right. I said, like, oh, fuck, I'm, am I to that stage? You know, I, I'm still trying to figure shit out, you know. <laughs> Don't, don't, don't lionize me, you know, aim higher or let's just be friends. Can we just, oh no, I don't have any advice for you. You know, it's just, it's funny. It's really funny. Well, I think it's also just because, you know, especially like you said, you're still in the process of figuring shit out, but also, you know, I think that type of a dynamic, uh, there's an expectation, right? You have an expectation of, he probably feels in that moment, like, oh, this person has an expectation of who I am or who I need to be or who I need to be for them as opposed to just sort of being in the moment together as two, two dudes hanging out, you know, and those two are, those two are different dynamics. I mean, I've, I've often heard some of the most famous people in the world go, Hey, you know what, you know, people, they, they want to come up and they take a picture, but it'd really be great if they were just like, Hey man, how's your day going? You know what I mean? Just like being part of a, because I don't think most, I think most people who are reasonably emotionally healthy do not feel super comfortable being elevate. Like, you know, like they want to just sort of right. feel like, no, 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 we're all, I'm not bad. No one's better. We're just all just hanging out. Let's just be, let's just be human beings having an experience. And it can just be that. Yeah. And I, I know that's how I feel. And, and I know that some actors are much healthier about, you know, dealing with their fans and, and letting them have that, that moment. They, they want right. This special experience and it's like oh, well who am i to deny them that too you know absolutely it doesn't matter if i feel like you know some schmuck you know like <laughs> like go <laughs> you know go get michael jordan's autograph you know it's like get, get uh, you know it, who, who am i to say you know just give them give them their moment but it it's an interesting thing it's kind of cool that he's on the show uh, he's on the show now i mean i wonder if uh I wonder now just because of social media and the internet and stuff, like when Deadwood was on, it was just bit the like just slightly before, I mean, there were certainly forums and there were certainly, there was certainly fan culture online, but you know, social media really just um, corralled and condensed it into like real tangible communities that could communicate in quickly in real time. And so, I mean, I, and I, I think I'm, I feel like I may have said to you when you came on to the walking dead, like, Oh, well, this is, this will feel different in a way to other stuff because it's a very wonderful and distinct community around it that it, it's just, it's just a different, you know, do you, did you feel the difference in that community versus other stuff that you'd worked on? I think so. I mean, it's, it's a rabid community, that's for sure. But also, you know, there's people you think of as your friends. Yeah. You know, that I've met at conventions or yeah. I only know from their Twitter handles or something. You're like, Oh yeah, that dude. Yeah. Hey buddy. You know, it still yeah. feels respectful. It feels, you know, they're, very, they're quite discerning. You know, they can really tear apart an, uh, an episode, you know, and get real detailed about it. And you know, but sometimes they're spot on with their theories and we're like, damn, we weren't, we weren't as tricky as we thought they figured it out right away. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, and again, I know, and, you know, we certainly don't have to go too far into this, but I know, you know, and I feel comfortable saying this because you yeah. addressed it, that you chose to leave the show and you had your reasons for choosing to leave the show, but it's still a very, it's still a very, um, to a young actor be like, but you're on a show. How could you leave a show? And it's like, well, yeah. because sometimes life takes you in different directions and it's sort of, you know, but it's, but it's, but it is a, it is kind of a, um, uh, a bold in the sense that you're really comfortable enough with yourself to say, you know, I'm going to choose, I'm choosing myself over a job. You know, I'm choosing my own path over this thing that is more certain, but I want to feel, and, and, and you know, I don't think you'll ever need a position where you're not going to work. So I'm, I hope you know and understand that, <laughs> but, but choosing, but sort of choosing yourself over a job is, is a really big, it's kind of a big deal, especially in this business where we're conditioned to think like, once you got something, man, don't ever let go of that thing. Cause you don't know, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I've certainly never done anything like that before. And, and, you know, it's not like, you know, they, they could have easily said no. In fact, they, they did at first, you know, that I think it was a lot up to them as well. I, I've struggled with the way to 
to tell this story because I, I really wanted to be, I said, let me take the heat. You know, I, I didn't like things people were saying to them. And I think they're very kind, you know, because I, I thought I was being very complimentary and fair. Because, you know, that, it's a great character. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's one of the best intros I've ever had, you know. But, I mean, you know, I played the guy for three years of my life. And uh, I just knew it was, it was no longer where I should be. And so I, I, I hoped that they would uh, see things my way. And, you know, on their own, I didn't, I don't write the episodes. I don't, I didn't choose how to go. I didn't, you know, it's, it's, it's all them. And uh, he called and he said like, well, this is what's going to happen this season. So I was surprised, but relieved, you know, but, you know, happy and grateful to them for allowing me to, to go. I mean, I, Look, I'm putting. I'll, I'll see things from the other side. Now. I'm executive producing my own show, you know, with my buddy Greg Garcia. You know, oh, that's fantastic! It's why, you know, and it's uh, and I can't tell you how excited I am about it. You know, it's and he is too, you know, and and the fact that he is excited again and uh, you know and proud of it, you know, it's really fucking good. You know, it's, <laughs> it's funny. It's so it's so much of us in it. You know, we've been involved with it together since its inception. And he's just a genius. You know, he just goes off into the woods. You know, I drop a few pebbles in the well and he comes back with with all those themes in something I never could have imagined, you know. And it's, uh, I just love the cast we've assembled. You know, so many people wanted to be a part of it, you know. And I'm just uh, so flattered that they took the call. Like, would you mind, you know, checking this thing out? Like, yeah. And oh my God, this is great. And, uh, and it's exactly one. Who knows? We, we might never get a second season. It doesn't matter. You know, we're going to try to do something here that 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 we love and that we're really proud of. And uh, I, I can't wait to talk to you again about it once we start shooting or once we once we get the season in the can. You know, it's, well, that's it, the thing. It's like like the, the it doesn't. Yes, it would be amazing if it got a second season, of course. But the experience of what you'll learn just doing the first season is going to be. It's invaluable. Like you couldn't can, can put a price on just learning how to be an actor and an executive producer and to yeah. really sort of and I oversee think everything. If I'd, you know, play John through the end of, you know, for three more years, I'd, I'd be almost 60 years old. I don't know if I could do this, this, this job anymore, you know, this particular one, you know, it might be something else. That's fine. I'm not trying to say like, I'm so decrepit, but I'm just it's like, I feel good. You know, I feel strong, you know, and I can still do this but I need to do it now, you know? Right. Uh, I have a movie I'm going to produce. You know, I got this great property called Moonsong. Uh, it's just, just up my alley. And I'm looking for a director for that now. And I'm going to get this adapted. It's just, it, 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 it feels like a new, a new season for me that I've, I've, I never thought I could do. I never thought I, I deserved to do or something that I, that I could be boss or that I could, actually get something like this made, you know, I've always sort of felt like, you know, I've enjoyed being of service to others, but, you know, I think something happens to you at a certain stage of your life where you're just like, I, I think I'm better off. You know, and maybe you would be too <laughs> without well, me fighting you all the time, you know, but also just like you, you just, you know, yourself better, the older you get. So, you know, the types of things that make sense to you, and and again, it's 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 another shift between taking any job versus well, now I'm auditioning the now I'm auditioning the production to make sure it's right for me. To you know what, I'm just going to go make the production. I'm going to make it exactly what I need. And I'm at a stage of my life where I know what that is. And also, you've worked on so many things that you've picked up so much, you pick, you probably picked up so much more knowledge than you even realize yeah. just from being in the process for so many years. I think, I think you can fall into a trap. Some people don't. And I'm amazed by those people. You, you're kind of one of them. I think that you just like, cause you do so many different things, but I keep waiting I've, my whole life for some kind of sign or, or I'm so, as soon as I get here, then I'm sure I'll know X, Y, or Z. Hmm. Well, no, maybe it's when I get here. It's like it's my driver's license or being old enough to drink or 
you know, just these, these landmarks you set for yourself. And then you get there and you, you're like, I still don't really know much, you know. And, and finally it clicks in that like no one does, you know, but, but they do it anyway, you know. Right. And, and you find out how, you figure it out. And your, your, your voice is valid. And at some point you got to admit you're a professional. That's that, that that that's the good kind of you like self awareness is good, but that kind of awareness of oh I am a successful person and I think it's it can be difficult because you don't ever want to the trap is like well I don't if I say that is am I an asshole for, for acknowledging it's like no you're just yeah, respecting like, the you're you're acknowledging where you are and you're respecting you're aware of I've been working for this many years I've been able to work on this many jobs I probably kind of know what I'm doing you know. So, and that's okay to recognize that. And none of this would have happened without fear, either the mindset or the experience. You know, it's, I will always be grateful for it. And I'm, I'm so proud to have been a part of it. And I'm glad that I'm in that universe, you know? Well, yeah, because it, you know, like that, um, John's, John Dory's character really ushered the show into the like, okay, this is like a zombie Western now. This is like an apocalypse, an apocalyptic Western. He was that character that really sort of solidified, you know, like when you have a sharpshooter who is just like, has very um, simple values and is a very like, you know, right or wrong kind of guy that sort of, and it really took it to that, to this next level. He ushered in this era. Um, he helped to usher in this era on the show of like, the, the identity of the show, like, like really locked it into that, which is great. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. You know, it's, it's one of the strangest experiences I've ever had. You know, it really is just for, in so many reasons, so many ways. It's, it's, it's very, it's very unique. I mean, the people just incomparable, you know, just incredible people. And, it's it's just it's a very it was a very strange experience, you know. But I'm so happy to have had it. <laughs> well, it'll be interesting now on the other side on the creation and the product and the 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 show running the executive producing side. You just have so much insight into being an actor, and so I think that will make you a good communicator for other actors. You know, like when you're working at if you if if you work on productions for a long time or you do stuff and then an actor is like struggling with something, you have the lexicon to say, okay, I think I know what you're feeling. So let's talk about it, you know, as fellow actors, but you also have the executive producer hat on at the same time. I mean, I hope so. I mean, the deck is pretty stacked in my favor on this one. Cause Greg is, Greg's Greg's like the David Meltzer comedy. As far as I'm concerned, you know, I just, he sets such a great tone on set from the top down, you know, and, uh, you know, everybody wants to work with him again. Every, everybody I know, everybody who's worked with him is like, I want to be on, I want to work with that guy. So I don't anticipate a lot of problems. You know, we, we, we set up, we set up a pretty good system. Um, but I, I do hope, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about me more than anybody else. You know, I'm, I'm kind of lonery. I'm kind of keep to myself. And like, if there's a problem, I'll just, well, I'll just work around it myself, you know, and, I know I'll need to be a better communicator. I'll need to be a better resource for my castmates, you know, and, uh, you know, and I certainly don't want them to feel like I'm the boss. You know, I want them to feel like I'm Jack, you know, you're Gloria, you're Barb, you know, it's, it's going to be, so I'm just so excited about these people. There's this one kid on it. I just love so much. And every time I see him, I say out loud, I'll be alone. Like, "Ah, I love this kid. Love this kid, and it's it's just I can't wait for you to meet him. <laughs> what's the and just for people who don't know? What's the show? It's called Sprung. Uh, Amazon bought it. We're going to air on IMDb t- TV, and, and it's about a bunch of convicts who get let out of jail early for for COVID. <laughs> we don't know what COVID is. You know, I've I've been in jail for twenty five years for selling weed, which is now legal. You know, okay. and uh, you know it's hard for us to get jobs. We don't even know where we're going to live, so we. Me and my prison girlfriend, you know, we move in with my celly and his mom. And uh, when times get hard, we decide that, well, you know, we're going to try to right the wrongs <laughs> from 
people who behave like assholes during COVID. You know, we're gonna, you know, it's a little you know. Robin Hoodie. It, it's 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 real good. I'm real proud of it. You know, there's been a lot of people I I wanted to get on the show that were either unavailable or or tried to be, but we and actors I really respect, and they all just think it's a, it was it was really brilliant script. So I'm I'm, I'm real proud. Uh, that Greg wanted to do this with me because he's a hell of a dude. Is it is it is it straight up comedy or like mix comedy drama half hour hour? It's half hours. Uh, you know, uh, I think we might shoot them all at one time, like a, almost like a five hour movie. You know, uh-huh. what I, mean? I don't know if that, that that's a loose plan, but uh, uh, it, it, it's a comedy. Yeah, you know, they're, they're, it's a comedy with a lot of heart. You know, I, I just felt like that was something else I wanted to do was I think people need a laugh and I mm-hmm. think people need a little bit of hope right now. Times are really hard, you know? Uh, so I just, I just want to do something that make people feel good. That's nice. Yeah, That's really on. nice. And I do think people appreciate that. I mean, I know like, you know, it, it you, you really do see the, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, entertainment isn't, yeah, you know, it's not, I, I wouldn't say it's, you know, it's not doing the work of doctors and, yeah, you know, yeah. critical care workers, it, but you can really see in a time of crisis where it does serve a function, where it does really like even not, just those breaks where people can just sort of disengage from the world for a second and just lock into something and feel yeah. normal and okay. It really does have that power to make fe- people feel grounded and okay and connected. Yeah. I, I- I, I don't think it's the most important thing in the world and uh, at all, but it's, it's not unimportant. That's right. You know, it, it, it has, it has value. And also army of the dead is coming out. Yeah, babe. May 21st. Yes. It's been a fun year. I, I did this Michael Bay movie called ambulance. Uh, so I've worked with Zack Snyder now and Michael, like all these dudes with their specialized red cameras, you know, an army of the dead. I saw it the other day. It's it's going to be fun, man. I wish we could see it in the in the movie theaters. I don't know if there's going to be one near me uh, when when it opens on the 14th of this month, but it's okay. You know, it's, it'll be fun to watch on TV with friends too. But it, it's a good one. So you know, it opens on the 14th or the 21st. Is it the 14th? Select theaters on the 14th, and then it's going to be on Netflix the 21st. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah I'm I'm really excited about it. I mean, was. I imagine just because the project sounds really fun, there was no, was there any kind of like, well, I'm working on a zombie show. Should I do a zombie movie? Well, I guess I probably should. Cause it's, you know. Yeah. You know, you know, I didn't ask. It was an off season project a couple summers ago, but maybe I should have, I don't know, but you know, it was, it's no conflict. It's, it's nothing like the shows. It's a completely of different, not. Yeah. different take on things. It's so far from John Dory. <laughs> You know, and there's zomb- there's a zombie tiger, there's a zombie horse, you know, there's there's zombie animals for Christ's sake, you know. It's fantastic. You know, Zach likens the there's different kinds of zombies in it. They have different qualities. Some some more familiar, and then there's these crazy fast ones. And you know, they're strong and can fight and they they, they think, you know, they, they're not writing books, but it's Zach likens them to like a pack of dogs, like those those wild dogs in Africa that hunt in packs. They're so intelligent. Yeah. Really, most dangerous thing in Africa. A lot of people think um, they're, they're like that. So it's, a, it's a real adversary. The danger is the intention is high. And I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> Strap in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to see it. I mean, it, it's, you know, it, especially because we get so much more excited when new things come out now, because we've watched so much stuff that yeah. it, it's just like, Oh my God, a new thing. You know, like we really plan our sort of stay at home date nights around, oh my God, this thing comes out Friday. Like yeah. it, it was so easy before to sort of like, yeah, you know, just kind of watch stuff whenever. But we've kind of gone back a little bit to event watching, you know, like, oh, this a new episode. Because we finished you know, everything. We finished yeah. Netflix, you know. It's yeah. Like a, it's the entire canon. <laughs> yeah, like we were watching uh, Kirkman's other show, Invincible, which is great. And it's oh, like a yeah. new episode would come out and be like, oh, my God, there's a new episode. It just came out. We, we get to watch a new, you know. I mean, so just knowing that there's a thing coming out that we have to to look forward to, you know, is uh, it, 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 it's, it delights me. It absolutely delights me. And that's like, that's we don't have to wait too much longer. No, it's pretty soon. What's today? The fifth? 
Yeah, we're recording this on the 5th, so it'll be on... Uh, we'll watch it on Netflix when it comes out on the 21st, so we'll, you know... Maybe we'll, maybe we'll all watch together. We might have a watch party or something. That'd be fun. Oh, my God. That'd be so much fun. That Are you are you good at watching? Are you, you're, it sounds like you're able to watch your own stuff, and you're, you're fine with that. Well, you know... I can be pretty critical, but, you know, I've, I've learned to just keep it to myself and just let people enjoy the thing. But, you know, it, you're always like, huh, I thought my posture was better than that. Or you know, I thought <laughs> I was really no one else would see that you're fixated on. Yeah, yeah, you know. But it's hard to avoid anymore these days. People post shit everywhere. It's hard to avoid your own stuff. But speaking of, I know I'm late for my... My last uh, press thing of the day for Army of the Dead. Well, you should go do that, Garrett Dillahunt. It's so nice to see your face. I, I love it. You You're the most fun, so I hate to Oh, see. man, no, it's okay. Well, you know, you could just call me, and we could just talk randomly anytime. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I believe you, but I might do it. You absolutely we, – we've already had the, like, let's be pals texts. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's, it's, uh, it's on, man. We're, we're okay. friends, bud. We're friends. You're good, dude. I, I feel the same about you. Congratulations on all the amazing, exciting things and and making good choices for yourself and, and all the stuff you're working on. I can't wait to see Sprung, and I hope to see you in person soon, my friend. Yes, sir. Keep taking care. Best to your wife. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. ID 10T scanning complete. Enjoy your burrito. 